Minister Chong, thank you for kicking us off and setting the tempo for our invigorating day ahead. Wonderful to have you on our panel. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you to everyone online and in person for joining us today. Today marks the culmination of a year-long endeavour from our Alliance for Action on Corporate Purpose to architect a framework and blueprint that will steward our corporate purpose roadmap for companies across Singapore who are on this very purposeful journey. So purpose is a topic very close to my heart, as I'm sure resonates with many of you here this morning. And actually, in fact, this morning I was just sharing um, with Mrs. Obel that uh, as I was preparing my notes for today's session, uh, my, my youngest came into the study and he sort of saw the company of good materials and the briefing stuff on my table. And he said, as 10-year-olds as do, he said, Mama, company of good, they, they must be good people who do good things. So indeed, he's not wrong. I have the privilege of kicking off our first very distinguished panel with three incredible stewards. If you'll allow me to make some brief introductions to our panelists. Mr. Edwin Tong, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth and Second Minister for Law, warm welcome again. Mr. Jaime Augusto Zobel de Ayala, Chairman of Ayala Corporation, one of the largest and oldest business groups in the Philippines with interests in real estate, banking, digital services, renewables, healthcare and logistics. Mr. Zobel sits on several prominent boards around the region, including closer to home, Tamasic Holdings, Singapore Management University and is a friend of Singapore. Welcome, sir. And Mr. Dylan Pillay, who is no stranger to our community. He's the Executive Director and CEO of Tamasic Holdings and a champion of change and innovation. I've had the privilege of attending many of your conferences and speaking engagements in recent years, and I'm continually inspired by the courage, efforts, precision, and determination for Tamasic to do well, do right, and do good. Welcome. So gentlemen, um, some rules of engagement, uh, a message from our sponsor. We've been assigned nine questions per panelist, 27 questions in total, four minutes per response. So we'll be here for about 108 minutes and I think that we've already overrun on time. I'm kidding, we'll, we'll, we'll go with the flow, shall we? Perhaps we can kick off with Minister Tong and encapsulating some of your uh, highlights from the speech. Uh, you shared benefits of building a corporate purpose-driven future. Uh, corporate purpose goes beyond CSR, more than programming, fundamentally a change of mindset to be a force for good. Why do businesses need to be purpose-driven and how will the role of businesses change with the shifts happening in the global context? Thank you, Irong. I'm glad that we don't have to take the 108 minutes <laughs> and 35 questions each. <laughs> but I, but I, I mean, just to reiterate a couple of points that I made in the speech earlier, I, I think the whole fundamental purpose, the role and social compact between a company and the people in society has changed. But more importantly, I believe that this purpose, uh, if you take one example, uh, has to evolve. It's because of this. There, is, uh, there are challenges in society today that government alone cannot solve. And if you just take one example, I mean, we have inequality in our society. Inequality can exist at the individual levels, and we've done pretty well to manage that inequality. We have looked at transfers, we looked at uh, uh, programs that we have in today's context. But there remains a stickiness when it comes to intergenerational inequality, and not just in Singapore, but I think many other societies, particularly the developed societies. And when it comes to intergenerational inequality, it's not as easy to deal with when you look at government programs, you know, transfers and other such policies. And so it takes really a, an all-hands-on-deck approach to try and solve a problem like this. And it is in that context that I see the value and the role of corporates when you begin to engage. And you know, when you ask ourselves, what do you mean by the social sector? Increasingly, I see the social sector as blending into and morphing into the corporate sector as well. Because corporates can do so much social good, it is quite unintuitive, if I may use that word, to speak of both as different sectors. So I would say corporates play an increasingly significant role in trying to move the needle on social services, social outcomes. And if you imbibe this as part of your corporate philosophy, corporates continue 
society benefits, circle remains stronger. And you look at this as a way in which we can solve intergenerational inequality as well, as one example. So I see that change in sh and shift in paradigm being very important. But you know, if you remember, it was not that long ago that companies were driven by uh, Friedman's philosophy that businesses exist only for profits, financial profits. That, I think, is no longer the case. That, I think, has shifted dramatically. And I think we see the seeds of that shift come to fruition. But I believe that a lot more can be done. Is Singapore primed? And, and I, from a timing perspective, and I ask this as a, a proud Singaporean, having come through the pandemic, in you know, a sort of a post-pandemic world, the timing of what we're trying to launch and what we're trying to achieve? I, I think if you just take a straw poll around the room and you look at the presence of so many strong business leaders taking time away to focus on corporate purpose, you have companies now having a chief purpose officer as well. The focus, the mindset, the whole philosophy is there. I think the time is right. And if nothing else, I think the last two and a half, three years of the pandemic has made people introspect a little more, look at their roles, and I believe that, I mean, there's no better time, you know, to launch something like this, but I would say it's opportune because people's attention and focus are there, and um, the whole drive and the whole vision has come together nicely. So I believe it's a good, it's a very good time. Thank you. Maybe I might turn to Mr. Zobel. Uh, many in the audience are very keen to hear of the Ayala and obviously the Tomasic journey. Maybe we can start with yourself, Mr. Zobel. Uh, yes, of course, and, and, and thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, um, in, in, in this gathering uh, with a topic, actually, that's very close to my heart. Um, I've just been about halfway through through a, through a book uh, called For Profit by, uh, by William Magnuson, and he goes through the history of the corporation. And uh, he goes back to Roman times. It's not the limited liability institution that you have today, but they had similar structures and moves on to the Industrial Revolution, East India Company and the like. And actually, he highlights that the formation of corporations in one way or another at that time uh, were really done for the public good. It's actually stated in there. Uh, but over time, uh, there was a shift uh, in, in the way corporations started to behave and where they saw their purpose. And uh, funnily enough, I was invited again uh, to another gathering some time back on the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman, the famous economist from the University of Chicago, who believed in exactly the opposite. He said we should just be focusing on, uh, on, on, on the profits and that should be the, the sole role of, of the CEO and the members of a corporation. I'll be frank, I, I came back to the Philippines back in, in 1987 after my studies at business school and I felt that there was something missing in, uh, in, in, in my education and the tools that I've learned, I, they were relevant in many ways to business. But I came back to a country, an emerging market country with tremendous pain points and it worried me as a young person. I, I said uh, I'd like to make a difference but yet there is a, a, a range of issues that were not even touched upon uh, in the academic institutions I attended. And so when I came back as a businessman, this was uh, just a short history of my own journey with respect to corporate purpose. I decided to spend about 10, 15% of my time uh, in the nonprofit sector when I came back uh, to start understanding the pain points that our society felt. And from that, the people I met who had a very different perspective uh, from the ones I had uh, and, and my colleagues had in the private sector, I realized that there were tremendous pain points uh, that were not being addressed. Uh, the government didn't have the resources, um, and, but the private sector as a whole had tremendous resources, great people, innovative ideas, capital. And it began to occur to me that as an institution and as I uh, moved into a position of leadership at Ayala, that we had to become far more relevant to addressing these pain points. If not, we would lose trust and uh, we would no longer be an institution uh, with a long-term horizon if we didn't continue to be relevant to the needs of a changing nation. Uh, that led me to do many things that, that led to the journey of today. Um, uh, we expanded our operations to be far more relevant to a whole range of, of, of economic players. Uh, we traditionally, as a company uh, 30 years ago, uh, basically dealt at the top end of the economic spectrum, and uh, we shifted that tremendously uh, to start making our products and services far more relevant to the vast majority of Filipinos who normally, in many cases, didn't have access uh, to the kind of products and services that many other parties did. Uh, it was a start of, of an evolution uh, towards shared value, linking the corporation up, and. While we started off as, as, as giving funds in a philanthropic way, 
uh, I started to blend, uh, I guess, the business of the corporation more directly to the developmental needs of the country. And that was an evolution that I went through. Um, and this whole idea of corporate purpose is absolutely linked to longevity. Uh, my belief was that if, as an institution, we did not become more relevant uh, to the changing nature of the country, if we did not align ourselves to developmental needs, if we did not address the pain points, then as an institution, we would not build trust in, in the society we lived in. It's something I felt very strongly. Uh, we moved from, from philanthropy uh, to integrating it into our businesses and fundamentally changed our business models. Uh, our real estate company, for example, uh, uh, a prominent one in the Philippines, uh, just dealt with, 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 with the higher end uh, of the market. We now have five product lines catering all the way down to social high. Our bank, um, uh, Bank of the Philippine Islands, uh, again, dealt mainly with the corporate sector. We now have a, a large microfinance institution that is part of it. We started to get involved in public utilities and dealing with uh, providing um, uh, services, water, electricity, telecom, at, at different levels of society, changing the way we did business, changing the way we build, uh, working with communities in different ways. Um, I think this whole issue of remaining relevant as institution does involve getting involved with addressing these pain points. And, and countries like ours uh, have many more pain points than, say, even a Singapore. Uh, but this whole issue of inequality, the tension that comes with it, has moved to the developed world. And now it's as relevant, as, as Minister Tong is saying, uh, to countries like Singapore as it is to emerging countries uh, 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 like ours. And one last thought. I guess when the United Nations came up with its uh, 17 um, uh, sustainable development goals, I felt it was a perfect time to also align our institution to that framework. Uh, it was something we believed in, it was something we were adjusting to, uh, but with it came a framework within which to look at the, the, the issues that would affect society, and I made sure that our institution became aligned uh, to those. I see uh, many individuals wearing the pin um, of the SDGs. Uh, I've seen uh, Dylan wear it on many an occasion as well, and Boon Heng. Um, it's very important that I think if we're to remain relevant, and trusted as institutions that we align ourselves far more closely uh, to the pain points uh, that, that we have in our societies. If not, we will start to get the tensions that can come from that as a scene uh, around the world for a variety of reasons. So uh, um, that was, I guess, the start of our journey and, and, and happy to talk about it uh, more at length later on. Thank you. I'm gonna come back and unpack uh, that uh, introduction and framing and obviously around the areas of decision points as you were building the business where you had to say no um, to critical decision points. So maybe, Jalan, if I can invite you to share the Tomasic story. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so today I don't have my SDG pin, I have a Tomasic <laughs> purpose <laughs> pin instead. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here and I really like uh, Minister Edwin Tong's uh, speech because it encompasses what the role of the corporation is today. And, it's, and really, it has always been the role of the corporation to perform in the way that he has articulated in his speech. And there's a reason for that. No corporation can, uh, can operate without a social license to operate. And that's true, because we're all created through statute. Statute through parliament, parliament through the government day, government by the people, of the people, and for the people. So we're not relevant to society. We will, constraints will be put on us as to how we should operate. The idea that we're here for maximization of profits is an idea that probably went only in line with, with 30 years of a way of, corp, of, of restructuring corporate America. And really, this is not an idea that resonates throughout the corporate world in any other place in the world. We have a multi-stakeholder obligation, not an obligation only to our shareholders to maximize profits. Because if that was our only obligation, we did nothing for society, we will lose our social license to operate. We therefore have obligations to employees, to customers, to uh, our suppliers, to communities in which we operate, and of course to our shareholders, because if you can't do well, you can't do right and can't do good. And we believe we have three roles at Tomasic. As investor, we're committed to doing well, because without doing well, you can't do the second part, which as a forward-looking institution, you're determined to do right. And if you can't do well and you can't do right, then you can't be inspired to do good as a steward. And that's embodied in our, in our charter, which we put in place in 2012. Our charter previously had the term maximization profits. We changed that to long-term sustainable returns. Because long-term sustainable returns takes into account all the stakeholders. And we were born in June 1940, 19, uh, 1974 to take uh, our role seriously as one for generations of Singaporeans. Because what, what, how we came about was when the government decided that it should separate 
its ownership of commercial operations from its policy-making function in order to ensure there's a level playing field in the context of economic development of Singapore. So all the companies that were set up by Ministry of Finance and EDB between 1959 and 1974, in order to create jobs for Singaporeans, better paying jobs, in order to catalyze sectors in Singapore, um, all those companies were transferred to Tomasic in 1974. Now, Tomasic today comprises both those companies or that original group of companies, some of, most of which have been sold, by the way, we only have 10 of the 35 still with us, and also the business that was started by Singapore Technologies as an arm of the Ministry of Defence in order to ensure that Singapore was able to be self-sustaining and resilient in the context of defending itself against any threat possible. And so Singapore Technologies started companies in ordinance and other areas and later on decided that these companies must have a commercial application in order for them to have a long-term sustainable future. And so both ST and Tomasic merged in 2004 to what is today the modern Tomasic. Now, when we were given these companies, our role was very clear. Grow these companies. Don't make them moribund. Don't just think of yourself as a passive uh, investor. Make sure they grow and they're still relevant for Singapore. And today, of those 35 original companies, we still own 10 of them. Certain companies have been formed through corporatization of public functions, and we've taken them beyond Singapore right, right into the world, like PSA, for example. We all know PSA. We're very proud of it. Operates the world's uh, most efficient container port. But today, PSA has 52 ports. When we took it over in, in 1997, it had two ports, Singapore and one in Italian. So our role has always been to grow these companies and see how they can be relevant, not just in Singapore, but also in the context of what the world needs. Because at the end of the day, uh, if we are going to be relevant in Singapore, we must get the best of what we get from the, from the world and bring back the things that work for us here to ensure that our economic development in Singapore continues to progress at a particular pace. So that's how we, uh, we, we were set up, and that's how we are today. Now, Tomasic is in what we call Tomasic 8.0. We're always an evolving institution. We're always a work in progress. And we recognize that the next decade ahead and more will be very different from the previous decades. I think what we've seen in the last one year is a, a, a hard knock to us that the 30 years of peace and prosperity that we were used to that catalyzed globalization and economic output for much of the world, brought many countries out of poverty into an into emerging middle-class world, might well have been an aberration in history. And now we're going back to a typical phase in, 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 in global history where we deal with conflicts, conflicts between nations, conflicts within nations. The social polity is changing in many countries. We have to be quite clear that in, for our future, we will be resilient. Resilience of the individual, resilience of cooperation, resilience in society. And that's the role that the corporate uh, plays as well. Working with governments, working with MPPOs, working with individuals to ensure that we have resilience in society. And I believe at the end of the day that for Tomasic, our capital is catalytic. Financial, natural, uh, social, as well as human. And I'll talk a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about that later on because otherwise I can go on and on and on. Um, but I want, to, I want to basically say that what the minister has just articulated, which also is in line with what the Business Roundtable in the US said in 2018, is not really about the modern corporation. It has always been, been about the corporation. It's just that maybe for 30 odd years we forgot about it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dylan. Maybe I can sort of um, build on that. Uh, how does the corporate purpose journey differ in emerging countries? versus developed countries? And maybe, Jaime, would you like to take that question? And then, Minister, after that, maybe from a Singapore context as well. Jaime? Well, I, I think uh, both uh, Minister Tong and Dylan um, uh, have mentioned a very important word. It's about resilience. Um, as institutions, we thrive in communities that are interconnected. As business groups, uh, we have products and services that we can provide. But if you have a society uh, that is not strong, if you have a society that's built uh, with a great deal of inequality, if there are social tensions, uh, obviously your businesses will not prosper. It is in our interest, as Minister Tong and Dylan said, to contribute in some way to creating resiliency in, in, in those societies, and we have to be part of that fabric. Um, I, I think uh, Minister Tong mentioned the word social compact. Um, I'm a great believer uh, that there has to be a link between our role as institutions and our contribution. We have tried to align ourselves uh, over time to the social uh, development needs of the country, um, mainly because in an emerging market context like the Philippines, 
uh, we've had great difficulties in, in, in going through a, through a cycle of progressiveness and, and growth. There are many challenges. We're a country of over 110 million people. Um, there's a great deal of inequality. If you look at our, our, our consumption triangle, it, 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 you know, the, the, uh, many of our middle class are, are abroad. Uh, you've got daily wage earners at the very lowest level as the vast majority of society. And, 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 and people um, uh, on the higher end of the economic bracket would be just on the very tip of a, of a triangle. Um, an emerging market uh, generally in, in a country like ours needs a whole re-engagement um, uh, of an institution like ours if we are to be relevant and if we're to build trust. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that uh, I have found this whole um, movement towards ESG and, and um, SDGs to be very relevant because in many cases institutions like ours in an emerging market uh, were looked at, people would look at our balance sheet, what is required by our SEC, uh, and it all involved just financials, uh, the profits. And people would look and say, you're a large institution, you're making a lot of money, um, you know, why are you relevant uh, to a country we are with a great deal of inequality? What I love about the shift that's taking place with ESG and, and SDGs is, is our own uh, financial statements, the information we give to the public now incorporate the many things that a private institution does to contribute, issues of employment, issues of engagement on the development side, issues of infrastructure, issues of education, a, a much richer picture of what the private sector does for society. I'm a great believer in the capitalist system, as you might imagine, I'm a great believer uh, that the capitalist system has a tremendous role in, in innovation, in bringing products and services, creating efficiency, and contributing to society. But that began to get lost in an emerging market like ours when people just began to focus, look how much money they make. Little understanding that putting capital to work uh, uh, also needs a sustainable financial equation. Um, this new world has begun to highlight the other components um, of, of, of institutions, uh, the other roles they play. And I think the ESG movement, the SDG movement, begin to highlight that engagement. Uh, but back to an emerging market, um, I believed in, in the early stages of my evolution in the corporate sector that, that these issues were more relevant to us as an emerging market. Uh, but now seeing people like uh, Minister Tong, uh, Dylan, talk about these issues becoming as relevant even in a country like Singapore, uh, which is very progressive and has advanced so much, uh, makes it a universal theme. And maybe just one last thought. Uh, we all face challenges now uh, that are much bigger than I think we've ever had in the past, but many of these challenges now need collaboration and cooperation. Um, issues of climate change, uh, one company can do its bit, but you're not going to change the way things work. I think there's a new theme that's evolving uh, that, again, was not part of uh, traditional education uh, in, in, uh, in our academic circles. We were taught to compete. We were told to build competitive advantage. We were told to succeed. Even countries are taught to, 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 to basically uh, get better than others and, and build a competitive advantage. But there's a new theme that I think should now become part of the rhythm of our daily lives, which is cooperation. Issues like climate change, the changes that are taking place through sheer cooperation globally among companies to make a difference is changing the landscape. And, and that's one other aspect, I think, of this new world, which we will have to learn to live with. Anyway, just some thoughts on that front. Thank you. Minister, maybe just to share your views on you know, Singapore's success story of having gone from third, you know, third world to first in one generation, how our, corporate, how our corporate purpose journey would differ, obviously, from the developing, sorry, emerging markets. Well, I, I share Dylan's view that, you know, it's not that something is, that we have suddenly come up come upon and stumble upon corporate purpose and today we are embracing it. It's always been there for us. I mentioned in my speech, of course, a little dramatically that it started from the charters of companies in the Middle Ages. I mean, that perhaps uh, not quite as dramatic as that. But, you know, if you look at our early founding philanthropists in Singapore, it's been there since our early days, pre-independence. And they've structured their businesses and the impact that they do good on society through their businesses. And that's always been in part of our DNA. Perhaps, like Dylan says, we forgot about it, or perhaps the priorities have just been a bit different, but it's always been there and part of our, our uh, corporate vision and our DNA. And if you look at, the, say, donors to the community chats, for example, many corporates have been quietly donating and making a big part of the community chats without making a big fanfare. Why? Because they see value in doing this, they see that they should put back profits, that they make from businesses back into society. But today, I mean, you don't ask what 
you know, how as we transition, as we move, what can be different for Singapore? Well, I think a number of things. One, I, I think as we now begin to look at this vision and this purpose in a more coordinated, collaborative, like Jaime says, in a more cooperative way, I think it makes sense for us all to be on the same page, and that's where the blueprint is going to be very useful, for us to have similar metrics, similar measurables, for us to compare and contrast with each other, for us to see what, are, what some of the core collaborators might exist, might be out there for fellow corporates to work with us. And I think that's one key shift that we can make to harness the, the good that's already there, to harness the, co the purpose that is already there. I mentioned in my speech earlier dealing with specific issues like food insecurity. I'll give you another example. And today, another issue that we face in society is in inclusivity. How do we ensure that those who are differently abled, less able, can find employment? That's an issue that we grapple with. But who best to fix this problem than employers, corporates, many of you out there? If you build and hard code an inclusive policy in your recruitment or in your HR policy, it will dramatically move the needle significantly. And we don't have to rely on businesses that are set up just to ensure that there is a social entrepreneurship to give work or employment to those who are differently abled. If you make this part of your DNA, you make this part of your corporate social purpose and hard code it into your recruitment policies, it will make a world of difference. So corporates can also now address issues that have come to the fore in society in Singapore that perhaps were not there in the past. And I think in, in this way, collectively, we can begin to look at this not just as every company on its own doing something good, which of course has always been the case, but coming together. And as I mentioned in my speech, becoming better than the sum of our parts, becoming stronger collectively, and dealing with societal issues that are prevalent today, and designing your own policies to address those shortcomings in society. Thank you. Jill and I, I was listening to an interview that you gave around in order to do right and do good, we, we need to do well. Uh, maybe share some views on the school of thought that purpose and profit are inversely related. I, 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 I believe that you should, do, you should make profits with purpose in mind. And performance with purpose is also an important consideration. I really believe in that. I want to touch on what, uh, if I may, uh, speak, uh, just touch on what uh, Mr. Edwin Tong just said about uh, inclusivity. Uh, Ravi Menon, in his IPS uh, S.R. Nathan uh, series of lectures, uh, in the fourth one, said that we have to relook at the concept of meritocracy. And it should be broader, it should be more inclusive, it should be compassionate. I'm a firm believer in that. Increasingly, for every primary one cohort, we're going to have more and more neurodiverse children. We have to start today planning for the future when neurodiversity is actually mainstreamed in Singapore. From the way we interact from young to education to even jobs, to the way we people can have careers. I think that's part and parcel of the role of a corporation. Because ultimately, our biggest resources are human resources, it's not the financial resources. I keep telling my colleagues in Tomasic uh, that we're in the people business. Because if I was purely in the financial business, I could use a bunch of algorithms and I won't need that many people but we're primarily in people business. And if you're going to be the people business then, and you have people in the center of it, then you're investing in human potential, but you're also celebrating human, uh, human capital as well. And I think that's the most important piece that we have to think about in terms of a, of a company. So when you think about performance with purpose, profit with purpose, that's an important consideration. Because you have to make sure that whatever we do is human-centered and human-led. Because otherwise we lose eff effectively our broader role in humanity. And I believe that the purpose of a company is to be a positive effect on humanity in many different ways. As Jaime said, I believe also in capitalism. I believe that our financial capital is there for innovation and growth. Because if there was an innovation and growth, society can't progress, I also. But then we must be responsible in the way we look at that journey as well, and not forget the other roles that we have, the other things that we can do in order to progress society, to take advantage of that innovation and growth that we find ourselves with. And so that's important because as we transform businesses, we can't just think of it in terms of the bottom line because there are social costs to transformation as well that should be taken into consideration, including workforce development. We've got all our companies on a transformation journey for their businesses because we can't sit still. The world is changing. ESG is an important consideration. Whatever people may, see, may say, 
It's here to stay. And it's not a long term uh, a, a thing that's out there in the long horizon. It's actually starting now. But yet we have to be sensitive between the E and the S. Because as much as we're pushing for decarbonization, we must realize that emerging markets, it's costly. Who's paying for the cost of transition? What it, there is a dichotomy between moving into green and making sure communities have access to electricity. Electricity for themselves, for the children, for children to have education, access to education, healthcare, sanitation. How do you do that if the cost of energy for renewables is imputed on a, on a rural community? So we have to be sensitive that sometimes the distinction between E and S, even as a corporation, and that's the difference between developed markets and emerging markets as well. It's not a one-size-fits-all, and even in Singapore, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So we have to be participative, collaborative, in order to address the, di the diverse interests we have in society, and also in the region between developed economies as Singapore and emerging economies. We do not operate in isolation of our region as well. So that's why I believe profits with purpose, because if you go into a country and you're able to, to take advantage of the resources of the country and you're able to make money from the country, you have to also do your role to uplift the communities because the benefit that they give you from the bottom line should somehow also find its way back to them so they have an improved life. And that's profit with purpose. Otherwise, you find after some time, whatever you put, you did there and so on could be very well nationalized so that the government can achieve the social purpose. And that may not be also good for that country. I think you can't develop, you can't depend or look to government on its own. So the collaboration theme is extremely strong. Uh, Hamid, you want to add on to? Uh, I'd like to build on something yes. that both uh, Professor Tong and, uh, and, and, and Dilla mentioned. Um, uh, 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 Minister Tong uh, mentioned the issue of employment uh, and education, and, and, and Dylan also uh, uh, touched on it. Um, I'd like to just stay on that one second. I, I think employment, uh, Minister Tong, has been a great pain point um, uh, around the world. Um, in emerging markets, it's a pain point. In the developed world, it's a pain point. Uh, uh, the structure of the world, uh, you've talked about supply chain issues, Minister Tong. Uh, there's been massive disruption in the way people work, the, the, whether the, there is a matching between their education and the, and the new workforce that's needed. I, I think um, uh, one issue that, that, that we should pay attention to as part of our corporate purpose is, is to make sure that we contribute in some significant way as institutions to the changing nature of the skill set that our uh, populations need. And, and why do I say that that should also be a role of business? Academic institutions, in many cases, have lived uh, within their own sphere, uh, and businesses have lived within their own sphere, and businesses expecting uh, institutions to produce uh, the kind of uh, workforce with the kind of skill set that's necessary. But the changes have been phenomenal. And one massive pain point is employment, the mismatch between the skill sets people are developing and, um, and, and what industry needs in this changing world. That's dislocated many people. It's caused social tensions. Um, and there is a role, I think, for institutions as part of their corporate purpose to be relevant to the changing needs of of what employment will need. And, and that leads me to one point, which is if there's ever a need for more collaboration between industry, uh, the private sector, and the educational institutions, it is now. And that goes back to the theme of collaboration. In many cases, and, and I'm, I'm just generalizing, of course, there, there's been a disconnect uh, between the educational system and the changing nature of the workforce. And, 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 and the one theme I think that uh, Minister Tong and, and Dylan have touched is employment education be key components of this fabric. I, I think corporate purpose should also include uh, making sure that as institutions and, and as a society, we remain relevant to the changing needs of that employment cycle. And that will involve far more cooperation, far more engagement by industry, by private sector, in working hand in hand with the educational sector to make sure that the skill sets needed uh, to be successful in the future and relevant um, you know, are, 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 are harnessed. So I, I just wanted to build on, on that point that both made. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions from the audience, if I may. Uh, perhaps the, should companies tackle issues that are not related to their business? Dylan, maybe would you like to take that one? Um, I think it comes to where you think your purpose is as a corporation, right? That's the first and foremost thing. And uh, we have a strategy clearly for the next 10 years. We tend to look at things on a 10-year look forward because that's the best way for us to plan what we want to do. Uh, and when we uh, decided uh, to, do, to articulate that to our group, we said we had to have a purpose conversation within Tomasic. 
which was a very earlier uh, question. And so we decided we have a one-year purpose conversation to get everybody aligned with ourselves. 70% of our organization globally uh, uh, participate in that. So that's 70% of 800 people, so 560 people odd. And we came up with a tagline, and really it's from them, bottom up, so every generation prospers. Because what does that mean, every generation prospers? So we articulate it in four different ways. Number one, we build with courage. Number two, we invest in human capital. Number three, we catalyze solutions. And number four, uh, we make sure that, uh, that uh, every generation grows going forward. We grow for generations. Now, when you decide that that is your purpose, then the question is, how do you embed it within your company? So that's a question of making sure that you are able to take that purpose and put it into how you operate day by day, as, either as a group within a function, across the different groups, or individually as well. And I tell you, the, the real thing is that we want our people to look at their jobs as not just being careers, but hopefully in time to come being a calling. And when you can take it as a calling, then the purpose of the corporation, your own personal purpose, converges. And then this question becomes easier to deal with. Because then I don't have to explain to people why is it that part of our profits goes into our foundation, and why does that foundation do all these things instead of it going into a bonus pool? Why? Because so every generation prospers. Because we have a role to play in making sure our, cat, uh, our capital is also catalytic as social capital. And what's social capital about? It's about social progress, resilience as society. And we want that to be the case so that the benefits that we have are also broad, more broadly shared. So therefore, do you have to tackle issues which are not related to business? I think every issue is related to your business because your employees have those issues on their minds as well. They have their personal purpose as well. So you've got to try as best as possible to converge their personal purpose with your uh, corporate purpose, and hopefully that way, they can help join you in moving things ahead, not just in terms of business, but in terms of things of, of what matters in the communities in which we operate. Thank you. I am going to take, the, if I may, Minister, the question on regulation still useful in the current stage or age to ensure corporates to do more for the community. Well. At some level, regulations are always necessary. I mean, you still, we talk about corporate purpose, we talk about good that can be done, but at the end of the day, regulations also tell us or tell companies by what measure, by what metrics they are measured when it comes to corporate governance, responsibility, disclosure, and so on. So I think that's a relevance to that. But when it comes to corporate purpose, I very much share what Dylan and Jaime has uh, outlined, which is, You've got to find your own level and find your own uh, uh, environment in which you can make that difference and make that shift. I mean, going back to the earlier question about, um, it was disappeared now, about whether you should be involved in things that uh, the company is not, uh, not related to the business of the company. I would say, in many ways, the best you can do as a company would obviously be in the area in which you operate because that's where your skill sets are. That's where your business has been engineered and geared towards. And you can continue to do that as long as you fit that into the mission. So the food security example I gave earlier, you deploy existing resources, reshape the way in which it is done, but your existing resources, manpower, talent, can be harnessed in a way in which makes a difference to one of the issues of society that we face. So it's, a, it's really about getting that aspect uh, sorted out that will make a difference. But I think, you know, to answer that question in a short way, I think regulation still needs to be in place to ensure compliance, to ensure that there's proper governance, and to ensure that there, re there remains a trust in the community, in the corporate. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here, highly rated. How do we get more boards to buy into company purpose? Perhaps, Dylan, would you like to try that one? And then I would love to get um, Jaime's point of view as well. I think the first thing is the board has, a company has to consider what is its mandate and have that discussion. What is my mandate? Am I here to build a business for short term or am I here to build a business for long term? And by the way, every company needs to have long term goals, objectives, and also short term strategies as well, tactical strategies, because you can't build for long term unless you have the resources that can be generated from what you're doing also in the short term. But you need to have that discussion, what is my mandate? If my mandate is to deliver a long-term sustainable return, then things should fall in place with that mandate. If my mandate is to maximize profits in the short term, well, you know, then you have to figure out that's, your, that's what you're going to do. 
Uh, so ultimately, I think that's how you get boards to do it. So now, very often, boards might think that uh, you know I, I have a shorter term outlook because that's what analysts want, that's what uh, in institutional investors want, and that's what I'm going to be measured by since I'm up for re-election every three years. Well, then you have to ask yourself whether you have a resilient business model if you're building a business based on a shorter term time frame. Uh, and, and that's the fundamental question. You know? And then you've got to ask yourself, if I'm going to build a business for the long term, you know, how do I make sure my employees understand that we're going to maybe have to sacrifice some, some of the shorter term returns for that long term, which should converge with their idea of their willingness to stay with us for the long term. Because when you can do that, then it's easier for you to get the boards to buy into the into corporate purpose because you're able to articulate it to your various constituencies, to shareholders, to employees, to the communities in which you operate. Jaime, would you like to add to that? No, I, uh, I think Dylan is absolutely correct. Uh, I'm very aligned with, with, with his thinking, but it takes uh, some discussion. So um, in, in a much smaller way, we, we are like a Tamasic structure in the Philippines. Uh, uh, and we have a number of boards that are under our influence. I mean, one area where uh, I try to influence is making sure that the leadership that moves up uh, to, to lead these institutions that I have a say in um, share the same view. Um, and it's a tricky view because the world is very competitive. All of us need a, a sustainable return on, on, on the capital we put to work. Uh, we have to be respected for how we use that capital. And, um, and it's a competitive world where we get all kinds of competitive pressures now that, 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 that push hard against that fair return on the capital we deploy. So we're working in that context, which has to stay strong and disciplined and, uh, and, and, and professional um, and, and credible and sustainable. Uh, but at the same time, we need to have another eye on making sure that we strengthen society. Um, I think the role of, of a leader of any institution is shifting and changing. There are no scientific metrics around this. Uh, I agree completely with what Dylan says. This is our this is a, a philosophy that you want to be part of the fabric and, and, and all of that within the context of running a successful uh, business. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a value set uh, and you really want to start attracting individuals in an organization to move up who share a, a similar view of the world uh, that is not uh, uh, personal centric, not corporate centric, but sees itself and, and will, is willing to promote an institution to be part of the broader fabric of what makes society work. Um, it's a tricky thing, uh, but I think institutions like yours here today, this gathering, this sharing, this putting ideas on the table is one great way of beginning to share a, a fundamental change in philosophy. I'll be very frank, I think if our societies are to succeed long term, if the private sector is to remain trusted, remain relevant, we have to shift. We have to shift to addressing pain points. We have to be part. It cannot be the role of government alone. It cannot be uh, the role of, of nonprofit institutions. Uh, we have to be part of the answers uh, that we face. Society is shifting. The world is changing. Business is changing. The, the nature of our global interaction is changing. And uh, there has to be a, a common sense of purpose, not only within an institution, uh, but within corporations and, and private sector within countries, that they have a bigger role. They have usually an inordinate access to the capital, to great people, to great thinking and ideas, um, and we have to put that to work. Uh, how much to dedicate? I don't think we should forget that we are, by nature, institutions that are responsible for the capital that's allocated to us, but perhaps extending our sense of responsibility uh, in a broader way, uh, as, as Minister Tonga said and as Dylan has argued as well, um, has to be part of the fabric if we were to remain relevant and trusted as members of civil society as a whole. Uh, maybe I just want to call out, and I, I love the question on, on boards um, building or buying into company purpose. So we have a lot of SID colleagues actually in the audience today, but it is an education. Uh, and a lot of that will be, you know, can be driven and you know, from an agenda that we can take on as well. Okay, I have a responsibility um, to call out the highest voted uh, question, the next one, uh, which is how does Tamase and Ayala just jumped, uh, operationalized corporate purpose into daily decision making, how is that prioritized and monitored and tracked? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I, there's some things where I believe metrics are important, there's some things where I don't think we can rely on metrics and you need to actually have a narrative and you have to be authentic about things and make sure that you are judged by the narrative that you have. 
the E, if you think about ESG, I think the E clearly, clearly, you can have metrics. Uh, the G, part of this metrics, part of it has to do with the philosophy culture of the organization. Governance is actually about culture, largely. And I think it's not just about metrics. The S is the one which I find very difficult to impute only metrics. Uh, because the S is almost uh, nebulous. You know, it's, it's out there. You sometimes can touch some of these things, sometimes you can feel them only. How do you put metrics on it? Uh, and I think metrics can lead to artificiality if we're just slavish to metrics. Uh, but when it comes to, but you have to be accountable at the end of the day. So when you say something out there, you've got to make sure you deliver. So if it's something said by my senior leadership team and myself, we have to make sure we deliver. What that means is we have to be aligned amongst ourselves as to what it takes to deliver on, on the, 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 uh, the, the journey that we've decided to put forward for the rest of our colleagues to follow through on with us. And so how do we operationalize it? Well, like I said, the first thing we did was make sure everybody comes under the tent, everybody understands what we're trying to do, and you don't force it top down. Because if it's not felt by the organization broadly, it will never be actually sustainable in the long run through generations of leaders, generations of employees of Tamasi. So we ensure that there's, there's constant communication uh, on how we want to do things. And that means there must be uh, transparency in the context of information flow, transparency in the context of how we are doing things so that people are not second guessing us. The minute you, you, you get into second guessing, there is the issue of trust. And if you don't have the issue of trust, then you can't bring people along their journey uh, and operationalize what you think the company should be on going forward. And you have to constantly iterate it, and you've always got to come back to the principles that you've actually laid down your journey, uh, laid upon for your journey. And you've always got to be measured by that as, as senior management. Yeah? And that's important, that we must have accountability. So I tend to send out long messages to my colleagues. Thankfully, I only do it three times a year because I think uh, it's... It, it, and, and the reason why I do it is because I give them my thoughts on all the issues which are, which are important to us. And I give sufficient detail for them to understand what I'm trying to say against facts. You know? I mean, you know, there's a famous US politician, uh, Senator Moynihan, that said, everyone is entitled to their own opinions but not to their own facts. And I think that's important. You, sh you give them the facts, you give them your view and your opinion, and you let them form their views as well. If they have a contrary view, you must be open enough to have that discussion with them. And we have many open forums with our colleagues to make sure that they are able to ask us pointed questions about why we're doing things. The reason why you have your purpose articulated is to, de is to define who you are and why you do the things that you do. And you must give them a forum to question you on that. And you must make it a safe forum so that, you know, if they feel that there might be some retribution if they ask the wrong questions of the boss, they can do so without having that fear. There must not be fear in the organization. If you want people to move along, they must move along on the basis that they believe it's going to be right or they want to be proven that it's the right way to go forward. That's how we operationalize it. Can I bring back an earlier question before I, I invite Jaime to give his view or response to that question, which was, when have you had to say no from a decision-making standpoint? Have there been an occasion that you can think of where the answer was no? Uh, uh, yes, I can think of actually many, uh, <laughs> but let me give one example. Um, many years ago, uh, and this is in the spirit, I guess, of, of what Minister Tong and, and, and Dylan are saying, uh, many years ago, as an example, um, uh, there was a, a, a piece of real estate in, in a secondary city in the Philippines, uh, Cebu, uh, that was being sold, and uh, it was a large one. We bid for it, and, um, and we won the bid, uh, an open bid. Uh, but there were a lot of uh, informal settlers in that. And uh, the party, the government, uh, who, who basically sold the property said, uh, you know, you're within by law uh, to basically evacuate uh, the informal settlers, that, that property is yours. Um, and uh, at that time, there was a discussion, how does one handle that? And, and I came in very strongly, and I said, look, uh, it's a large property, there's informal settlers, we, we have to address that problem, not by sticking to the rule of law, uh, by, by addressing um, uh, the needs of this community and handling them as fairly as we could. It, 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 by law, we could have, we, we, we could have just um, uh, asked them to leave, uh, even forcefully, um, uh, but that was not the feeling that I felt would in, 
uh, would result in, in trust. So we brought our foundation in at the time. I worked with the local government and said, can you allocate land to us that we can resettle these individuals? And through our foundation, we will build businesses and help them organize themselves into a community uh, that can then become self-sufficient long term. And it took some expense on our part, but I think by handling it that way, um, uh, we created trust uh, with, with, with a disenfranchised community. Um, it took a great deal of work because there was a lot of mistrust even when we came in and said, we'd like to work with you. They didn't even want to be relocated. But in the end, we ended up with a win-win. They ended up owning their own land. The land was given by the government. They participated in it. Um, the foundation helped organize them into a working community that could then build up their own livelihoods and the like. And we had peace and, and calm, and the development then succeeded and did very well. Um, I think that was one case where this philosophy of working uh, within the broader context of what's good for society uh, came to the fore and resulted in a win-win-win situation all around um, and, and, and results with, with the corporation also succeeding, uh, even if there was an expense involved in a, in a project like that. Thank you. Minister, can I invite you to take the question? Oh, it's disappeared. Um, sorry, one second. It's gone further. <laughs> Uh, yes, how to ensure that, com so I'm going to do a two-parter, how to ensure that companies do follow the social side of things, given that there could be some who may still be focused on profits, and then possibly a, a point of view on government to do more in its procurement power. Can you see that one? No, procurement power mm. to better encourage organizations to focus on purpose by preferring companies of good as vendors. So maybe let's do the first one first, which is the social side of things, given that there could be those who are more focused on profits. That one. Well, actually, if you've been listening to all the different comments by my colleagues here, Dylan and Jaime, I think the answer there is pretty obvious. It's, it's, you've got to see these two aspects of the question, the social side of things and profits, as being really synonymous. Because if you listen, if you, if you listen to what uh, um, uh, my two colleagues have been saying, it's because you have gotten the social side of things right, the vision and the purpose right, that you can then start looking at profits. I mean, what was it again? Do well so that you can do good. Do well, do right, do good. Do right, do well, do right, and do good. So I, I, I think it's part of the same equation. It's on the same spectrum. So I would not start from the premise of the question that these two purposes are at two ends of the spectrum. In fact, I would say they are synonymous. And... Um, I gave some examples in my speech earlier about how a corporate could organize itself and take advantage of, say, brand perception, value to employees, for example, alignment of interests and purpose with employees, ensuring that your employees are bought in to the vision and purpose of the corporate as well. All of these lends itself to stronger corporate values and in turn translates into stronger corporate purpose and profits. And I think that's how I would look at this question. Can I do a follow-up, um, which was... Can I just uh, add yeah. one question, uh, one point? Minister mentioned Homage in his speech. Homage is a company that we're invested in. It performs a very useful role in the context of this issue. It takes care of the social side because it, it provides home care. Especially if we think about aging population, it's a real, very real issue for us. If one in four in 2050 is going to be over 60, definitely me for sure. Um, and the burden on, therefore, a productive part of society is going to be very, very high, much higher than it is today. How do we alleviate that burden somehow, somehow so that productivity continues to improve so we still get economic development in order to have a more resilient society? So it's not as if, uh, as Minister said, that the social and profits are separate. In fact, profits are important too because when you get profits, you can then afford to think about the social side as well. I also don't want to leave people here with the impression that for some reason, because of corporate purpose, if we're launching a blueprint, that somehow profits becomes a bad word. It is not. I think the corporates do have to exist to make profits. And it is important. I mean, of course, I mean, we, we don't want to go down the path of what Milton Friedman said about how it's the be-all and end-all and the only outcome we have. But I think for each of us, the takeaway cannot be that profits is somehow a bad word, that if you focus on profits, that's bad. Because profits gives you the ability to do that social good and it becomes the whole raison d'etre behind your corporate purpose. Thank you. I'm going to 
sort of group a few questions together because there are a few coming in around um, attributes, leadership, alignment of managers, executives with corporate purpose when company incentives for them tend to be financial in nature. Uh, so Dylan, a recent quote from an interview on your own personal purpose journey and the attributes, you said, to whom much is given, much is expected. The weight of this responsibility. So with the 250 plus business leaders in the room and another 300 online, what is your advice to our audience? Uh, is the question about incentives? No, no, no. no. I, was, I was grouping it together because there was a lot okay. of... Um, personality right. attributes, yeah. characteristics of yeah. leaders, yeah. so yourself, and then managers that yeah. you look to bring into the so, organizations. Yeah. So I'm a firm believer in that statement, to whom much is given, uh, much is expected. Because what you've been given, and the fruits of what you've given, somehow you have to make sure that a broader group of people is able to benefit from that. Because that's what it means to be a steward. Okay? You can't be a steward for yourself. You know, a steward has got to be relational. And therefore, more broadly, uh, you have to make sure it's more broadly dispersed in terms of the value of what you have been given. And so in Tomasic, we've always believed in that. We were set up to be a steward of the companies that were placed with us by the government. And not just to leave them as they were, but to make sure as a steward, those companies could continue to grow and continue to be of value to the community which it served, which is primarily for Singapore and now more beyond. So I believe at the end of the day that, uh, that, you, that boards of companies have to remember that the stewards of a legacy of the past, foundations built by others in order to take the company forward and building for next generation so they can then build for a generation forward. I think that's very important. And that's what it means to me that much is expected. You know, the, the, the mantle of leadership comes with the burden of responsibility. They go hand in glove. The burden of responsibility is huge, let me tell you that. It's not a day that goes by that I don't think about. Uh, what, what we have to do as a company. By the way, I did that when I was a lawyer too, as, as Minister Tong reali re realized. You know, you think, you know, you always, you know, it, 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 you always think about what is it that you can do right to go forward. Because when you have the leadership, you know people are dependent upon you. And you can't do it by yourself, by the way. You have to make sure that you have a team of people. No man is an island, okay? No person is an island. But the, but the idea here is that when you're given something of value, you have to grow it. But you have to grow it not for yourself, you've got to grow it for, for your institution, but for others as well who can benefit from it. And, the, and like I said, we, you know, we have multiple stakeholders at Tomasic because the returns that we have contribute towards the net investment return contribution framework of the government, which is, by the way, on the MOF website. And that contribution uh, is therefore part of the reserves of Singapore for the long term, and part of it goes into the budget of the government for social programs of Singapore. And in an aging society, and we're one where the, you know, the, there's so many changes that we see, not just within Singapore, but even beyond, for Singapore to be made relevant and to move forward, it's an important thing that we must re remember that what we do has consequences, but what we do can be also very, very beneficial to a broader group of stakeholders than just our shareholder itself. Thank you. I may, if I may ask a, a build on that, so what do you look for in your leadership teams of your companies and your CEOs? What are the critical skills the CEO must have? Um, and the types of leaders steer to purpose even when the chips are down? Uh, well, in a way, this is more uh, both art and science. Um, on, on the science part, obviously, in, a, in an executive or a leader, you're, you're looking for, for, for strong technical skills of one way or another, issues of judgment, issues of decision making. Um, but I think there's a new element that comes to play, um, which is also the values that drive that person. Do they have a long-term outlook? Are they interested in building value over the long term? Are they, uh, by nature, individuals who want to serve a, comp a better good? Uh, it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, but I think you can find them in organizations, the way they work. I think it's also important to go through a journey um, in a young uh, executive's life, which also exposes them or gets them to address certain pain points that society has. Um, sometimes you find them in foundations, uh, sometimes you have them in the private sector, but if you can find individuals who uh, would like to instill um, uh, that sense of addressing uh, pain points into your organization, or at least expose them to it, you begin to get the new mindset in, 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 in their contributions to an institution. Uh, these are subtle things, they're more art than, than science, uh, 
Um, and I think all of us as institutions have a responsibility to open up this topic as people move up in organizations to make sure that there's an alignment uh, between one's belief in, in the role of that institution and the rest. Um, uh, issues of stewardship involve much more long-term thinking, it, much more integrating in what we do for a bigger purpose much later on. Um, but somehow, as, as pointed out by Minister Tong, that has to be balanced with uh, the financial obligations we have as stewards of capital. Um, I think it, it can be hit. I think we'll all become far stronger if we broaden our sense of responsibility to a community uh, and a country. Um, and it'll make us, I think, better people and make the institutions we represent more trustworthy. Um, it's hard to come up with specific examples. It's more a new state of mind, a new attitude, and gatherings like this are precisely to put these issues on the table, uh, see if people buy into them, and then how people contribute within that context uh, will be up to them and how institutions contribute. Uh, but it has to start with a broader philosophy that we do have a broader responsibility. Um, I think Dylan has accentuated it and, and, and highlighted it properly. And we will need a new type um, of, of leadership uh, that comes up in our institutions that are aligned to this way of thinking. Can I just um, yeah. add, add a point? You know, it goes back to the earlier question as well and what Jaime just said. Uh, you know, um, I believe fundamentally uh, that that Singaporeans are a, uh, a good-hearted group of people. And the reason why I believe that is because NVPC, I better do a shout for NVPC, in one of his reports two years ago, which I read, said that 77 to 78% of Singaporeans gave money, <coughs> contributed for causes. Now, 78% of our people do that. That's a phenomenal number. That means everybody is, a, we're a nation of philanthropists. So we do well as a company, and we can therefore make sure that the fruits of our growth and our success can be shared with employees, the benefit has a trickle effect beyond just that some of us into others. And it then coincides with their purpose, which also therefore goes into a broader range of issues than what they're dealing with. And as a whole, as a society, we grow together and we become better and better and better. So I believe at the end of the day, all of us are catalysts for action, whichever, wherever you are. And the question for us as a corporation you know, is how to do well in a way where our people can also be cat catalyzers of action. Thank you. Gentlemen, just a quick time check update. We've managed to get through nine questions, um, so we're still along. I'm just joking. Um, we, we, need to, we need to wrap up, so maybe I can invite um, each of you to give some closing remarks. Um, and perhaps, Amy, would you like to go first, and then Dylan, and then Minister? Uh, maybe just, just two words to summarize my, my point of view. <clears throat> Number one, uh, as an institution, I've felt we have to remain relevant to the changing nature of our society. <clears throat> um, a country like mine would be very different to one like Singapore, so we each have to find our own level of relevance. In my case, it was basically to contribute significantly to the level of inequality that we had in our country. Um, and that's uh, actually a, a part of ESG that's usually given less weight to. Uh, the social part, there's been a lot of focus on climate and the environment and governance. Uh, but the social side, issues of inequality uh, can create massive disharmony in our societies and lead uh, to basically a, a, a disunity. Um, I think uh, in, in my particular case, this, this issue of relevance uh, made me turn our institution to be far more relevant to the changing nature of the economic structure of our country. And basically, I pushed, I guess, our institution uh, to change its business structure, to change its business principles, to change its models of doing business, to be far more relevant to doing business, business at, in, in the lower economic sections of society. So that's one element. The last one, uh, the second point, is, is, is trust. How do you build trust long term? I think if we are to be stewards of our institutions over the long term, you must be looked at as an institution that is trusted. And that means not just by obeying the law, it must mean that you are also part of the fabric of what makes civil society as a whole work. And a contributor to that, not adjunct to it, just there uh, to, to make a return uh, on investment that is, that is divorced, I guess, from, from a contribution. So those two words, relevance and trust, I guess, would be uh, ones that are driving forces in, in, in my sphere of influence. Thank you. Thank you. So I've, I believe that the next decade and beyond is clearly one for partnerships. Um, I think both Minister and Jaime have spoken about it at length. Uh, I do believe that we have to collaborate together because we, 
each individual organization, each individual doesn't have the all the requisite skill sets uh, to be able to deliver what they want to do or what's good for them, for their organizations or even more beyond. And so the only way we can do that is to augment what we have with what others have and bring the best of what we have together to address an issue out there, find solutions and make sure that we get to the right outcomes. And I think that's important for us and that's the best way to build up human capital. So we have to be what we call a networked organization as Tamasic. Network not just with other business groups and other people who, have, who are in the industry with us or, or, or uh, are able to help us achieve our corporate objectives, but even network with, uh, for example, our, the unions in Singapore that, we, that are in our companies to ensure that workforce development goes hand in hand with, uh, with business model transformation, for example. Making sure that we are also networked with social organizations because, you know, as with previous generations of business leaders in Singapore, Tomasic has a foundation too. And much of our social capital is affected through our foundation. We do some ourselves, but we partner with our foundation, our, partner, our foundation partners with others. So I believe at the end of the day that we have to be a networked society, if we can be, to achieve the multiple different uh, objectives that we have, you know, for a better society. Because it's only we have a better society that our companies can thrive also. Thank you. The one thought that I will leave you with as I close is how inspired I feel when we talk about corporate purpose, talk about vision, and talk about how we measure our success in the corporate world today. And I think I, when I look around the room today, I made a point earlier that so many of you are, are senior business leaders in your own right, running your own companies. I am not sure that 15, 10, maybe even five years ago, we could have a gathering like this where all of you have the same philosophy, are here to have that same mind share and want to grow and network in the way that Delana has mentioned and partner with others to try and bring corporate purpose and therefore corporate good into your own DNA. And I think that's very inspiring and very heartening. And earlier on, you asked me, you know, is this a good time? And I want to reiterate that I think it's, 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 there's never a bad time. But I think if there's ever a good time, it is now as we emerge out of the uncertainties of the last three years, with a lot more introspection, with a lot more realization that we cannot exist alone. And I, and I think if there's one message from social distancing and so, you know, safe management measures that we've all come to experience is that we cannot exist alone. And I think that philosophy and that thinking is a little microcosm of why we are here, why this corporate purpose has seized us. And how I believe, and I feel energized by just chatting with many of you earlier before today and you know, on previous occasions during the leadership forum as well. And, I, and I, can, I can feel that vibe and I can feel that this is something that you, are, you care for. It is not something that you were asked to attend and therefore you're here. But I think you're here because you wanted to make a difference to the way in which your own companies work. And I feel very inspired by that. So I thought I'll leave you with that closing thought. Thank you, Minister. Um, so thank you to the esteemed panelists for your enlightening and inspiring views. Uh, just so you know, it's a moderator 101 trick uh, when we go to the, for training that you get your panelists to do the summary so then you don't have to do it. Um, so to all the leaders in the audience, thank you for your ongoing conscious and conscientious co contributions and commitments. Know that it makes a difference. Driving corporate purpose is the heartbeat of companies, people and society. The decisions that you make, that we make collectively in partnership will impact generations to come for good. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank, Thank you. you.